Welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted to be joined today by Pedro Olmedas, who has been collaborating with me and our friends from BBC Cape on a project, uh, the Neurodiverse Experience, uh, for the last 18 months. Uh, Pedro is part of Aodine Systems, which is also an offshoot of uh, one of the, the key universities in Barcelona, and I always get the names wrong or the letters wrong. It's, it's specs at IBEC, and you can tell me what the acronym means in a moment, Pedro, but you're doing amazing research into um, virtual reality and um, the human brain and interaction and design, etc. It's fabulous to have you with us because I think that the, the stuff that you're working on is is absolutely fascinating. So uh, welcome, Pedro. And if you'd like to tell us a little bit about, you know, a little bit more about specs and aodine, etc., and and how you came to be working in the field, that'd be great. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to to be here. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about my profile. No, so I'm a, I'm a computer engineer, and I made a specialization in the world of audiovisuals and video games. And approximately like 10 years ago, uh, I started to work in academia, first in a research group dedicated to medical imaging analysis and visualization. And since 2012, I'm part of SPECS research group. SPECS is a neuroscience uh, research uh, a group dedicated to study mind, brain and behavior. And the particularity of specs is that you use a lot of technology to advance this, uh, this knowledge. No? Technology like robotics, like virtual reality, augmented reality, computational models of the brain. So <clears throat> it's, it's a really multidisciplinary environment where uh, a lot of people comes together to, to make these advances in neuroscience. And I, in the group, I'm, I'm the currently the technical director, so I mainly deal with all the technology uh, that uh, that is required to, to make these studies in the group. And since 2016 or 17, more or less, a spin-off was created uh, in the group, uh, firstly to uh, work on the, or to transfer one of the a success system that has been researched in the lab, a neuro rehabilitation system for uh, uh, making rehabilitation uh, for people affected by a stroke or other brain damages. That it's that use a lot of interactive uh, technology and gaming uh, approaches in order to uh, favor uh, rehabilitation. Right? This is a rehabilitation gaming system. And uh, then Eodine also started to uh, to work in other projects related with uh, uh, interaction, virtual reality, and this is where the uh, the, the interaction with Neil and Atos uh, and BBC Cape started because we they were very interested in looking into some new approaches uh, for uh, how to to show what is neurodiversity to the world, and then this is where where we start to to work together. Yeah. And, and thank you. And I um, came to visit you in in Barcelona earlier this year. And I have to say, you, uh, your premises are like a a big boy's toy shop. Um, <laughs> it's just full of gadgets and, and things that I want to play with. I'm quite. I'm quite jealous. That said, you know, we're 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 getting there with the kit. We've got the the Oculus ready for doing demos and 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 looking forward to continuing to develop it uh further. So so what this is, uh what we've been working on has been um really designed to talk to people to give them a better understanding of how people who are neurodivergent experience the world because quite often if you're ADHD or dyslexic or you you're uh, autistic or any of these have any of these sort of neuro uh, diverse traits uh, you're likely to be easily distractible you're likely to find that 
uh, certain of your senses are amplified, etc. Um, but this is something that neurotypical people, that's people that don't have these traits, don't necessarily understand. So, so what we wanted to do was was to create an experience where people could experience some of this. It's it's certainly not perfect, but it's it's immersive, um, and that we could track it and that we could build upon that to build understanding, both in terms of helping people um, understand how they need to interact and empathize with individuals, but also helping designers empathize when they're building systems or, or, or creating environments so that we can be more inclusive in the future. So um, I think it's uh, not only is it fun, it's, it's exciting work, um, but it's absolutely um, I think the the beginnings of, of of something that could grow into something bigger because through exploring some of this and through the 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 next bits that we want to add, which I think you can talk about shortly, the the sort of the bio biofeedback element, which is where where you guys have particular expertise, then I think we can get some really uh, sort of deep insights. So yeah. do you want to tell us about you know we're we're planning you know we've we've done this thing we're going to share it and people can come and play and we're obviously keen but but we want to go further and do you want to share some of the stuff that you're doing around sort of uh, you know biofeedback in general and also you know I know you're doing stuff with people with you know electrodes embedded in their head and all sorts of really interesting work. Yeah yeah sure um, so yeah just to track back to why we started this the idea of uh, having a, a virtual reality environment to, to to let's say to have this experience i think it came from from the previous work you know, from from bbc cape uh, where they created a, a video an immersive video uh, to to explain these features of what it's been to be a, a person with the with neurodiversity and uh, I think the main idea was, okay, let, let's try to make this interactive, you know, because at the end of video is, is a very, uh, it's a presentation that you cannot change. And if we move into the virtual reality interactive applications, then it's, it's more credible you know, in terms of, a, of a experience. So I think this is where it, it started. And and then one of the key features that we always thought from the beginning is let's let's also link the 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 experience uh, with the the let's say what the person is feeling at, at the moment of having the experience, you know, to to make it even more uh, personal. With that, what I mean you know, now linking to to the specific question of Neil about what we are doing in terms of uh, biofeedback. Um, so in, in the in the research group, there is a lot of work uh, related to uh, linking interactive systems with uh, with the, with emotions and with uh, unconscious reactions of, of people. So, for example, you could uh, use sensors to understand uh, what's the 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 level of uh, anxiety or the level of uh, stress that someone can can have at some point and then you can build uh, adaptive uh, systems that try to understand this information and react to that so the, the ways uh, that a system can react to that can be through changing uh, certain aspects of the visualization or changing audio features uh, for example if the goal is to to try to relax then uh, then it just try to, to make different things like uh, creating more uh, relaxing colors or sounds for, for the person. So in this way you link emotions and, and physiological states with a presentation. And then you can do that for a, let's say, less invasive way, which is uh, like using like wearables or using uh, sensors uh, like a, a galvanic skin response, which is a, a little uh, band that you can put on your finger or in your hand. Um, and then you could also use more invasive uh, techniques like EEG. So it's, build, it's having a cap in your head 
that uh, have sensors that touch the skull and then measure some uh, activity in the brain. Um, there are some EG caps that nowadays are less invasive, so with less sensors and less, uh, let's say, um, it's, it's less problematic. That if, if you want to get like really good signals, you need to put some gel. And the, the extreme case, which is only now, let's say, not, we use these kind of techniques, but basically just for analysis uh, or deep analysis on neuroscience. Like is is putting implants into the into the brain, no? so really like an intracranial implant, and this is just for for very specific cases, uh, like for example for epileptic patients that you want to uh, measure some specific activities in areas of the brain to understand what is the focus of this epilepsy. Uh, that's why you could you would like to do this kind of uh, invasive technique. No? But for the context of the application we are not going to be invasive at all. We want to use uh, non-invasive measures in order to at least try to get some ideas of what is what are the emotions of someone when is uh, using this, uh, or is, is experiencing this application. I um I love all of this and of course uh you know Neil made a, a a comment that this was like a boy's treasure chest which is great but at the same time we and and a, and I know that Neil meant this too but uh, but we no, love you're it right as women to correct too. me you're no, right I'm not correcting me. you. I'm not correcting you because you didn't say anything wrong. I'm not correcting you because you were talking from your perspective. And I think we have to be careful of not saying, yeah, but what about? So I didn't mean it like yeah, that. No, no, but, no. But actually, when I went there, to be fair, it was it's, uh, mea culpa. Um, but yes, it, it's definitely my, my thing. But yes, I know you. Deborah's a geek. Well, you know what, the thing that's, but I think the thing that's very interesting is that um, I, I don't, I've always been a geek. My father taught me to be a geek. My father was a technologist before anybody knew what that meant. And so I always have been such a geek. But what I think is interesting is that in, in the first place, I, like Neil and uh, millions and billions of others, um, I struggle with mental health issues. I struggle with depression. I sometimes it feels like this black hole that I fall into, and but I often don't think of myself as a gamer per se. But what I'm realizing is I am definitely a gamer. I'm not a gamer in what um, some people, men and women, boys and girls, would consider what I always thought of as a gamer. Somebody that's in there playing the games, and you know, um, I, I think of. Warcraft or whatever it is my son and my husband play but my daughter is a gamer too but she's different but what I find is that I am a gamer I remember when I first got on Twitter it was like a game right well if you do this and you do this you do and you're like gaming it so I think my idea of what it means to game being a gamer has changed and then using it to then you know, apply it to things like this, where we're trying to understand how do how can we be healthier? Because I know with corporations that I'm dealing with, the number one concern that they have is of all of the things that we're trying to do to include people with disabilities is mental health issues. And um, Neil and I were just at the Global Business Disability Network Forum with the ILO in Geneva. And I'll tell you, and I know Neil's my friend, whatever, but Neil gave one of the best presentations I've ever seen, ever. And I've done and seen a lot of presentations and it was very rich. And sorry, I'm sorry to compliment you, but it was, it was very, very rich and very interesting. And the audience loved it. And the taking what you did and then um, on the other panel were some amazing corporations and organizations, but I think understanding what you're doing and how it can help us bring our best self to work and into society into the, every aspect of what we do pedro i just think is brilliant and i love the bbc cape stuff always have i see such innovations coming out of the uk but 
I, at the same time, it feels like, and maybe it's just me waking up, but it feels like everything else is changing. Um, you know, right to that conversation, you know, are, are women doing gaming? Are they, are we really truly into the STEM? Are we really embraced? Is it really not STEM, but it's the STEAM, the, the science, the technology, the engineering, the math and the arts, right? And so tying all this together, I think is so interesting and, and I love the work you're doing. I'm really glad you're on the program today because this is how I think we as human beings can get healthier and really understand who we are and what we can bring to society, especially at a time when we've never seen disruption like we're seeing right now in technology, advanced, technological advances. So I, so, sorry to just, if I'm babbling, but I just am fascinated with all of the intersections of this, including the neurosection, the, the neurodiversity, the mental health aspects, the global aspects, and how it's all coming together. So I'm fascinated with the work that you're doing there in Barcelona. Great, great. Thanks for your enthusiasm. It's, it's really uh, encouraging to, to work in these kind of things and how it is, uh, perspectives um, just to add to your to your comment uh, related to uh, all the concept of gamification and, and what we are doing uh, actually we we try to let's say to be away from from the from the tech gamification itself because we we are building this experience not not as a game but more as a an experience to create empathy you know, in in others you know, so that that you can really understand what it feels to 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 be neurodiverse. So you can be in the in the shoes of a person that has this condition and try to understand from that first person perspective. Oh, what this is what it means. This is what it means when he says that uh, that it's overloaded by information or or that noise is is complicated for for him. You know? So that this is. Let's say the line that we are trying to take, it's, it's, it's using a lot of gaming technologies, but more to, to be in the, in, the, in the classification of a serious game. No? Most people talk about uh, this kind of application in this way. No? It's, a, it's a serious game application that we are building for creating empathy in others to, to, to create this neurodiverse experience. I think one of the areas, go on, yeah. Deborah. Sorry. Well, no, I apologize. I, you know what? Um, this is for both of you. As I listen to you talk about this, and as we're once again figuring out how our brains work and how we can bring our best self to society, and, and I worry about the lack of good data for people with disabilities, especially as we're moving forward as societies with artificial intelligence. I'm curious, and this once again might be a question for both of you, how can we use some of the data that you are learning on this project to help complement, supplement, um, I can use other words, data sets to truly include people with disabilities and their whole selves in these conversations because I'm very worried, I know a lot of us are very worried about the lack of data and the bias data that we have for people with um, all the different disabilities. So let me send that, give that question to both of you to see if you think there's an opportunity and thank you. Do you want to ask for first, uh, Neil? Okay, yeah, I think, yeah, okay. So, so, so quickly, I think that we're looking at some research uh, as a result of this. So, so um, using, you know, neurotypical people um, and neurodivergent people uh, and, and measuring their reactions to the experience. And, and we think that there can be a, a bit of academic research out of this. Um, we need to be careful not to overemphasize because we're, you know, it is still artificial. It's virtual reality. It's not real. Rea it's not rea real reality, if you know what I mean. But 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 understanding how people react to these kind of stimuli, and I think that 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 kind of academic research can be useful. Um, so so we're we're certainly interested in that. But I also um, I I see some other uses as well. Uh, and potential, you know, if we're understanding how um, 
people are reacting, we might be able to, some of the other things that are happening with um, virtual reality at the moment is people are creating virtual reality tours. Uh, you know, one of the things that the BBC have been doing is um, creating tours of their buildings so that people who are nervous about going to new places can know what they're like in advance. We might be able to take some of this data and, and use that in a mixed reality situation as well, so that, that, that people are getting the kind of clues that they want. And then I think the final thing, which is not so much about data um, itself, although it will use data, is to look at how we might actually um, have a, a situation where when we know there's overstimulation, we might actually use a way of use the the augmented reality and the the virtual reality glasses as a way of reducing stimuli. So you're only able to uh, you're able to tune out some of this stuff. Um, so there are some um, non non electronic glasses already that use prismatic lenses that actually blank out advertising screens. So if you're walking around a city and you've got all these flashing lights, et cetera, there are some prismatic lenses that you can wear that make these screens disappear. So um, I think there's you know, some quite rich stuff going to come down the line, but it's early days. So over to you, Pedro. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think what so far already has helped us to, to, to advance our understanding of, uh, let's say, for example, the, the specific um, features that, uh, that neurodiversity means. Because when we started to, I mean, one of the things that we are doing is that we are selecting some uh, features like, um, let's say, when someone focuses on some part of a room, then the, the sound of that specific feature, like a clock or the air conditioning, uh, increase. No? So that, that's a typical thing that happens when someone has neurodiversity. So in order to, to understand that, we have to, to go to the literature, understand what all these uh, features that are known in, in what someone has neurodiversity and try to implement that in, into our application. But then, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Neil, but some of these uh, features are not uh, are reported. Uh, we, we collected this information from, from different sources, so it, there is not like a, a very good uh, taxonomy already described about what are all these features no? and what is the level of validity of, of that. No? So I think one of the, the, the progress that we can make on this is really trying to validate that this is uh, Correct, no? By having these studies that could compare uh, uh, person with disabilities uh, experiencing the same environment without any intervention, compared to mm -hmm. someone that is a healthy person that is uh, experiencing the same with some of these traits. No? So this could uh, help us to collect data to really validate and advance our understanding of these kind of things. So, so I think. You're right, there's not huge amounts of data, but at the same time, there is some. Uh, and some of the people that we know within our community are probably leading the charge on this. So there's Dr. Nancy Doyle uh, from Genius Within, there's Professor Amanda Kirby uh, from uh, Do IT. Uh, and they're looking at um, you know, the, the crossover traits, the, the occurrence, and, and have actually got quite you know relatively large data sets so in the case of of do it they've been working with people in prisons and they've been doing um profiling and screening for thousands of of individuals so what they're doing is you know building up you know quite a big data set of people's preferences and how they learn and how they work not necessarily how they react to their environment but 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 again they've got quite a, a body of, of sort of useful, you know, uh, con, you know, decent scientific data there. So I think that that's um, something that we can, we can look at further. Um, one of the things that I think is really clear is that, that when we're talking about neurodiverse traits is that there is this big sort of overlapping Venn diagram 
and we've all got lots of crossover traits. So, um, you know, I've been talking about dyslexia for a long time. That's because I got diagnosed with dyslexia decades ago. Um, but I recently got diagnosed with ADHD, which came as a surprise to me, but to no one that lived with me or knew me. Thanks for telling me, folks. Um, <laughs> he says as he fidgets in his chair. Um, but um, but there's an overlap. So some of the things that I described as being as a result of my dyslexia actually turned out to be traits that actually were enough to put me diagnosable as having ADHD. And they were less to do with the dyslexia. So there is this sort of overlap, and it's that understanding of this. And I think the, that's where concepts like neurodiversity as an umbrella and neurodivergence are useful. I mean, the, the, the wording, the language, the understanding of these crossovers is new. You know, we've, we've got um, an evolving language. People talked about neurodiversity. Um, you know, we've had Judy Singer on who pretty much coined the term neurodiversity. Um, and and it, it for a while it was adopted by the autistic movement um, now it's wider, and I think again we're looking at how the language will evolve. But I think that the key point is that lots, there are lots of people who are whose brains are wired differently, who have real value to contribute to society if we understand how to get the best out of them, how not to disable them by cre creating environments that are toxic for them. You know, so uh, I think that the work that we're doing is really exciting as a result of that. To get away slightly from, from neurodiversity, because um, you also do lots of stuff with robotics and, and, uh, as well. So, and, and I've, you know, I, I was super excited by your lab and, and, and all of the stuff that you're doing with like 4D spaces and stuff. Can you tell us a little bit more about all of that kind of the, the kind of spatial environments that you're creating as well and, and where you see that going? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the things uh, or one of the line of research is uh, interactive technologies and adaptive interfaces. Um, so we have an, an immersive uh, space, which is very unique. It's called the XIM, the Experience Induction Machine. And it's a, a 360 degree uh, projection room that has an interactive floor that it's able to measure uh, the, the, or to track people in space, to also is equipped with a lot of sensors like the ones that we are trying to use in our application for measuring physiology, eye tracking to understand gaze and uh, pupil dilations in, in people and uh, 360 degree sounds and we use this environment uh, to to perform behavioral studies basically uh, one of the applications that we have uh, worked recently in the, in the last years it's a it's an application to uh, to explore big data you know? so to one of the problems that we wanted to solve is uh, big data is becoming uh, a huge problem because it's for a human it's it's it, you are not capable of understanding that amount of information no? and for especially interactive and visualization systems you need to provide some help in order to 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 search and to explore these data sets so we have been doing uh, interfaces that could or that can adapt the amount of information that is presented to the user and to facilitate that uh, that exploration, linking with the with the physiological state of the person. You know? So to give you an example, uh, it is uh, it is known that, that uh, cognitive uh, workload is it is a a measure that is related with the with the working memory. You know? So if if you are exercising a lot of your memory, the cognitive workload increases. And you can measure that by the constant increase of your pupil, right? So when, when for example, we present uh, an information in a in a in a in a presentation to someone, and then we detect with these sensors that the cognitive workload is very high, that means that 
this person is really overloaded by the amount of information that you are presenting. So we uh, have created adaptive interfaces that try to decrease the amount of information so that uh, it's uh, adjusted to the level of uh, understanding that this person can have with a presentation. No? So this is one specific example of how we are using these immersive spaces with interactive technologies to, to explore big data. We also uh, recently have performed a, an experiment where we have put a, a robot in space. So we are using a humanoid robot that is similar to, let's say, to the size of a person. And uh, we have worked in a cooperative uh, task between a robot and a human. No? So the, the task was a very simple game, like a punk game, the, the classical Atari game from the, from the statistics. And then this, the, basically the punk is in the floor, right? So the, there is a, you can imagine a, a floor with the projection of uh, the paddles and the, the ball that is bouncing from side to side. And basically on one side, it, there is a robot and a human playing together. And they, they have to work together to, to try to, to hit the, the ball that is coming. And then our experiment was to give some personalities to this robot, you know, to, to, to give a, a more uh, competitive personality or a more uh, passive personality during the game. And then we were studying the, if, if someone was really able to, uh, to understand that this robot had this personality. You know? So that, that's in the context of understanding human-robot interfaces and social interactions between robot and humans. You know? and so, so these are the say some examples that are also an example that mix the two kind of environments that we use, robotics and immersive spaces, uh, to advance the studies on and human interaction and human robot interaction. And it is wow, really it is fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah, wow. That's amazing. Uh, uh, and it's fun too. I've had a play. Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and, and even though you know it's a robot, even though it's clearly not human, you still anthropomorphize them to a certain extent. You know, you're still giving them some kind of, uh, kind of attributing some kind of personality to them. Yes, I, I, I think you've got a comment, Deborah. Yeah, it, I, I know that when I went to uh, China, uh, I visited the Huawei Tech for All, Tech for Good lab, and they had some very interesting virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality. And it, it is, in the first place, I was spellbound by it. I, I was just, you know, you put on, and you just showed, one, before we went on air, you showed one of the devices. You uh, held it up, uh, Neil, but it, it was... It with yeah yeah it, it it was fascinating because I haven't really played with it that much and where it, I, I was just mesmerized with where it took me and and then you have the games and they actually had games where they're strapping stuff on you and you're getting on what looks like a little trampoline and you're and that was, uh, it, it was really, it was just so interesting and it was using so many different parts of my brain and uh, it, it just, I was fascinated with it. I, I don't know enough about it, but I just think it's so interesting because it feels like we are continuing to learn about our brains and who we are. So now we decide in society that we're broken because we have ADHD. We're broken because we have dyslexia. We're broken because we're blind. We're whatever, fill in the blank of why we're broken. And what if it's not true at all? What if we have these amazing brains and there are so many ways to supplement our brains? And I, I find, for example, I was talking to somebody, I, I go into this one store in the United States and I don't know what they do, but when I'm in the store shopping, the mirrors, the way they have the mirrors set, it confuses my brain and I keep seeing stuff and it startles me and it, I find it is, I, I actually stopped shopping in the store because every time I went into the store, I want to concentrate on, do I need that shirt? Do I need this? Do I need this? But they keep doing something in their design that confuses my brain. And I was talking to a couple of other people about it and they're like, I've had that same experience with this brand, which I'm not going to say it out loud, but 
so I, I think all the work you're doing here and what Neil's doing, other things with Atos, what BBC's doing, um, what Magic Leap is doing, what Huawei's doing, what a lot of people are doing, I think in the long run, it's going to help us understand who we are as human beings and how we can supplement what maybe some people consider weaknesses. Maybe it's not weakness at all. Maybe it's actually a benefit. Maybe it's a superpower, blah, blah, blah. But uh, I'm there's so much to these topics. And the more we dig in, the more we're like, wow, okay, there's another huge, you know, opportunity here. So I was just curious if you know you're if you're seeing some of that too but i i'm there are things i'm seeing that i don't always understand what is happening with my brain and once again i've talked about this on air but watching my husband who has early onset dementia watching how his brain how he is processing things now it is fascinating and terrifying to me at the same time his he has lost the ability to to dress per se, he um, he uh, he knows that he's supposed to put on you know um, undershorts and jeans and a shirt and socks and shoes, but he gets confused by you know sometimes he'll get out two pairs of jeans for example, and so under Understanding our brains, I think, is going to help us age in place better. It's going to help us be more meaningfully included. But I just think it, it, the work that you are doing is just so important to understand who we are and really valuing the differences that, you know, of the way our brains are made. So I don't know if either one of you want to comment on that. And I know we're almost out of time, but um, let me throw that to you. Uh, well, definitely, I think... Uh that uh, it's really important to advance our understanding and, and picking also from a comment that uh, Neil made before. I think, and from my perspective, technology you know, it would be really important in, in playing a role on, on our, on, on not only in understanding, but also on providing uh, help and, and support on, on, on counteracting this uh, person that someone can call it disabilities but at the end is to integrate them into in, into in, uh, into the the the, the, the say, normal way of life of, of of the rest of the society so i think it's really important uh, advances in technology and i want i think we will see a lot of new more uh, that uh, will help a lot in this direction fantastic We've reached the end of our half an hour. Um, need to thank our supporters as always. So thank you very much to Barclays Access, MyClearText, and Microlink for keeping us fed, watered, the lights on, the heating, the you know, captions all done beautifully. Uh, we really look forward to joining you on Twitter on 3rd of December, which is International Day for Persons with Disabilities. Also Purple Light Up, Deborah's already, you know, living it with the hair and the glasses. Um, purple being the colour for uh, for disability. So thank you very much, Pedro. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. It was a real pleasure for me too. Yeah.